Hello and welcome to lecture number 20 on force control. In the previous lecture, we looked at uh, control of nonlinear systems and then uh, stability. So, we looked at the effect of dynamics on a system and how dynamics acts as a disturbance and uh, how the controller for a robot system is actually a two input system. And uh, we'll move on further today to force control. Now, in whatever discussion we have had in the last uh, uh, few classes on control systems, that makes the assumption that uh, the robot is not in contact with anything. That means the end effector is free to move in space and it is not uh, contacting uh, the environment in any way. Uh, and uh, today we will move on to force control. Now force control is a case where the robot end effector is actually making contact with an environment for performing a task or for moving in a particular direction. Now there are many applications where this is required. For example, in grinding where the robot is using a grinding wheel and is uh, grinding a particular surface. Okay, or for you can imagine a case of writing, a robot is taking a pen and writing on the board. Okay, or a case where a robot is mopping the table. So the robot is taking a cloth or a sponge and is mopping the table. Now in such cases, uh, there is contact between the environment. And the most, uh, the most practical case where robots are extensively used is in electronic assembly. So in assembly, there is contact. So the robot is going to take a part and insert it into a hole like in electronic assembly and there is contact between the part and the hole. Okay. So today we will look at cases where there is contact and how do we deal with such cases. So today's lecture is on uh, force control and let us see when there is contact between the environment and the robot end effector, how do we control such systems. Now we have to understand this concept of force control very clearly because the force space and the position space are orthogonal to each other. So as we go along, it will become clear that what do we mean by this orthogonality of force space and uh, position space. So whatever we have discussed so far is in position control, we can talk of PD control, PID control and, uh, and uh, simple other kind of controllers. But uh, the basic assumption being made is that this is in free space. So the robot end effector, if I draw it here like this, this is my end effector and the end effector is free to move having some trajectory in space. Okay, There is no contact with an environment. Now in contact tasks, the robot has to apply a force and also move in a particular direction. You know, what do I mean by that? For example, look at this example. So we have a wall uh, and there is a gr grinding wheel. The robot is holding this grinding wheel. Okay. So this is the robot end effector and this is my robot manipulator. Okay. Now this grinding wheel is rotating and how do we do grinding? The grinding wheel must apply a force in this direction. Okay, So this is a grinding wheel. So let me draw it a little bit uh, larger like this. So this grinding wheel must apply a force on the environment. So it is touching this here. Okay, So this is rotating. So there is contact there and when we are grinding, the grinding wheel must be uh, must apply a force in that direction. And when it is uh, applying a force, it should also move in this direction. Okay, so it is having some velocity x dot in that direction. So now we see this is an application where a grinding wheel, a robot is holding a grinding wheel and it's applying a force on the wall where it is grinding and is also moving in a particular direction. Now, if you look very carefully, the force is in this direction and the velocity is orthogonal to that. Okay, so this is something uh, I will explain more clearly as we go along, but please take note of this. Let's take the example of uh, of uh, wiping a table. For example, uh, this is a table, okay, and uh, let's say this is a table and there is some liquid which is spilled there and the robot is using a mop. So, for example, there is some cloth, okay, and the robot is holding this cloth, okay, using its uh, gripper and uh, the robot is supposed to wipe this table. Okay, so, there's another robot, right. Now, the robot has to wipe this table. How are you going to wipe the table? There has to be a force in this direction, okay, to make contact with the surface of the table and the end effector has to move in this direction, which is orthogonal to that force direction. Okay, that is how we do wiping. Now, if you think how a human does wiping, exactly in the same way, we apply a force downward and then we move sideways. Okay, now what about writing? Now, writing has exactly the same uh, application where when you're writing, for example, this is a piece of paper and you're writing and uh, this is, uh, for example, your pen or pencil. Okay, so the robot end effector is holding this pen or pencil. This is the robot end effector and this is my manipulator. So it is applying a force in this direction and it is moving in that direction. That's how we write. Okay. So these are examples where uh, where a force is being applied 
and there is motion in a particular direction. Okay, and these are applications that come under what we mean by force control. Now we also need to listen. Uh, we need to understand this concept of uh, stiffness, which is very very important when a robot interacts with the uh, with the environment. Now what this basically means is that you can have a hard environment, for example, a very solid wall. Now you know that if you hit against the hard environment, what will happen? The wall will be damaged, or the robot indefinitely will be damaged. Okay, so. Uh, there is a direction in which you can move very fast or there is a direction in which you need stiffness to be very high and a direction in which you need stiffness to be very low. What the, now stiffness can be looked upon as a spring. So let me, uh, so stiffness is something uh, which we can represent like a, uh, like a spring. Okay, stiffness of a spring which you are familiar with. So force is equal to K into, let's say LX is the deflection here. Okay, so this K is sometimes called, is called the stiffness of the spring. Now you know that if the stiffness is low, it means the, the spring is a weak spring. So what would happen is you can have a lot of deflection in there. That is equal to K into del X. Whereas if the, if the stiffness is very high, then you can have very low deflection, okay, for the same force. So what it basically means is that uh, your deflection del X here is equal to F by, uh, by K here. So for a very high K, you'll have very small del X for the same F, okay. So by changing this K in different directions, we can make the robot behave uh, having high stiffness or having low stiffness. Now this is required, why? For example, if you're moving in this direction, okay, uh, and you're expecting contact to be made, then you must have very soft motion control, okay? Whereas if you're having free motion, then you can have very stiff motion control. Again, it's a question of, uh, of high stiffness or low stiffness. So if I have low stiffness against this wall, it basically means that the robot will not get damaged when it is going to hit the wall or make contact with the wall. Whereas in the free space, I can have a high stiffness and uh, because it is free motion, it is not hitting anything. Okay, So this concept of stiffness when a robot is making contact with a hard environment or is in free space is very, very important. Now, it is if you think a little bit, in the human hands, also we have a lot of tissue on our fingertips, which gives us some amount of... Uh, spring-like behavior. So when you hit a hard object, what happens is that impact force will be absorbed by the soft tissue and we are not, and we are, our hands are not damaged. Okay. So let's look a little bit uh, into the physical meaning of stiffness here. Now suppose you have, uh, this is the physical meaning of uh, stiffness that you have, uh, 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 let's say a mechanical linkage like this and the person is going to hold it and is going to push it. Okay. Now depending on and this mechanical linkage here, if you can imagine that there is a spring which is connected onto the joint, just for, uh, let's imagine, okay. So if you push it, how it is going to behave would depend on the stiffness of the spring now. For example, the person is uh, pushing it here and you can see this is, it's very hard, difficult to move. It's behaving like a hard spring. Now this is behaving like a low, uh, very low spring, uh, low stiffness spring. Now again, the person is trying to push, it doesn't move. Now you see the person is trying to push and it moves easily. You impact force, high virtual spring rate, okay? low virtual spring rate. So basically what you're seeing is that this device or this mechanism is behaving like a spring. And whether it's a high stiffness or a low stiffness, that is the one that is going to determine uh, how the system is going to behave. Okay. So here we saw that this was a low spring rate. Okay, so this is a, uh, a very low spring rate. Okay, this is a high spring rate, the person cannot move, okay, which is very easy to understand. Then we have, uh, uh, this is followed by a low spring rate, so the person can move very easily, okay. Now, what about a spring rate? The rate at which you are moving, now this is a very high virtual spring rate. So it's behaving like a very strong spring, so it's very difficult to move. Then it is behaving like a very soft spring, and it is very easy to move. That means your rate at which you can move is uh, very high. Impact force. Okay. Now this basically gives you an understanding of this uh, physical meaning of uh, spring constant. Okay. That spring constant K. That by changing that, how you can make the system behave in a particular way. Now let's come to robotics. And now in robotics, we can see that uh, the robot arm. Uh, can be made to behave in a particular way by changing its stiffness. For example, here is a, a case of a robot having a high spring. Okay, so if the person pushes it and leaves it, what will happen is uh, uh, the person has a high, the, sorry, the spring is very high, 
So what will happen? It, it will just come back quickly. So you see here. Sorry, let us uh, look at this. Okay, so the person is pushing it and leaving it, and it's just coming back. It's a very high spring. Okay. Now this is not a way the robot hand should be behaving. Why? Because the person can get injured. Okay, or the robot hand can get damaged. Now what about uh, here? Now let's see a little bit more. So this is uh, the next case where you're having a low spring. Okay, low stiffness. I mean. So in a, in the case of a low stiffness, what would happen is uh, just see here very carefully. The person is pushing it, it, it has a low stiffness, so it is very easy to move it and uh, it can go and stay there. Now simply by changing the stiffness, sorry, let's look at the low spring rate first. This is a low spring rate. Okay. So you take it there, it goes back and it comes down slowly. Okay. So by changing the spring rate, you can actually play with the way the system is going to behave by changing the, uh, the spring constant. Okay, now this gives us an idea of, uh, so look at this again, it is simply by changing that spring rate and by using different kind of controllers which we call uh, either stiffness controllers or impedance controllers. That is something what we will be looking at today. Okay, this is giving you an idea in terms of robotics, how we can make the arm behave in a particular way simply by changing the stiffness and I also hope you understand uh, what we mean by the word stiffness here, physically. Now, the framework for controlling partially constrained environments, it basically means partially constrained means in some directions you can move and in some directions you cannot move. This is the meaning of the word partially constrained uh, environments. Now, let's try to understand this concept of position control, okay, position control and we have force control on the other side. Okay, so these are two things we are looking at today. Position control we have already looked at, you know, PD, PID control in free space. What about force control? Now suppose we have an environment here. This is a wall. Okay, so we have a wall here and you are applying, if you can imagine, you have uh, let's say a pen or a stick in your hand and you are applying a force in this direction. Okay, now you are applying a force, let's say 10 newtons in that direction. Can you apply a force on the wall? Yes. Why? Because the wall is giving you an opposite and equal reaction in this direction. Okay, that is the reason why you are able to apply a force. Now in free air, uh, let's look at this question, can you apply uh, apply uh, 10 newtons in air? Okay, so suppose at this point, let's say there, and I'm going to apply 10 newtons. Can you apply in uh, 10 newtons in air at some point? No, you cannot. Why? Because there is no opposite and equal reaction. This is not there, which means you cannot apply force. Okay. Whereas in this particular case here, because there was a wall, you could apply a force because uh, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, So you can apply a force only if there is an opposite and equal reaction, not otherwise. So that's the first point to remember. Okay, So this is point number uh, one, if there is an e opposite and equal reaction okay, coming from the surface. Now what about position? Now suppose I say you move in this direction with a velocity of 10 meters per second. Can you move? Uh, in this direction I mean on the surface of the wall move in that direction on towards the right with 10 meters per second can you move no you cannot move why because the wall is constraining you you can't move in that direction okay but suppose I say you move in this direction with 10 meters per second uh, velocity okay so x dot is 10 meters per second now can you move yes you can move why because there is no wall nothing is obstructing you okay. so this essentially shows that you can have force control you can apply force or you can have position but not both in the same direction okay so please note this position force cannot be applied in the same direction uh, applied in same so control of force and position in the same direction is not possible okay so please note this so force and position control uh, cannot be uh, cannot be done in the same direction cannot be done in same direction okay so this is something very very uh, important to note that if you can apply 10 newtons on the wall you cannot move with 10 meters per second in the same direction why because the wall will not allow you but position and force cannot be done in the same direction but they can be done in orthogonal directions 
Okay, so here you're seeing that we can apply 10 newtons towards the right and you can apply have a velocity of 10 meter per second towards the bottom side or the top side. Okay, and uh, you can see the force vector and the position vector are orthogonal to each other. Okay, so this is very, very important. Please remember the position force vectors are orthogonal if you need to control both of them together. So if you are trying to control position and force together, then uh, how can we do that? That is the question that uh, we are uh, trying to look at in this application, okay, in this lecture today. So let's look at a particular uh, few applications. Now this is a case of a crank being rotated. Okay, so a crank is a lever which is being rotated. Uh, say for example, I want to rotate this crank so that uh, I get a particular velocity, angular velocity like that. So how I'm going to do that? I will hold the, I'm going to hold, uh, the robot is going to hold the handle. So this is my handle. The robot will hold the handle and is going to rotate the crank in a particular direction to get a particular resultant velocity. Okay. Now if you look at this task, uh, in this task, uh, there are, we are controlling what? Okay, so let's look at here in terms of control. What is it that we are controlling to do the task? What is the task in the first place? So the task is to rotate crank. This is my task. How am I going to do this task? The robot is going to hold this handle and it's going to rotate in a particular direction. Okay, now in order to do that, what are the various variables that we need to control? Okay, what are the various velocities and forces that we need to control? Now, the first thing that we do is to fix a constraint frame. Okay. So a constraint frame is first fixed here. Now my uh, uh, the C, XC, YC, XC, YC and ZC is the frame which is fitted onto that. So my force and positions are going to be applied with respect to this, uh, this frame now. Okay. Now if you look at this frame, we can divide the forces and motions into natural constraints and artificial constraints. So this constraints, okay, we saw in the previous uh, previous case here when we talked about a wall, when we are able to apply a force or we are not able to apply a position control in a particular direction, this wall is behaving like a natural, is behaving like a constraint. Okay, so it is constraining your uh, task now. So similarly here, these constraints are divided into artificial constraints or natural constraints and artificial constraints. So these are natural constraints and there are artificial constraints. What is the meaning of them? Now the natural constraints are there because of the task itself. That means because of the nature of the task, these constraints are there. You can't do anything about it. Artificial constraints are the ones that you have to control, okay, in order to perform these tasks. Now, so let's, uh, so how many of these are there or what are the control variables? So we need to control what? We need to control number one is uh, uh, is the forces. Okay. Now forces would mean what? Uh, forces and moments. Okay. So we have force and moment which needs to be controlled. Then what we need to control? We need to control velocities. So what kind of velocities? We have linear velocities and we have angular velocities, both of them. So how many of these variables are required to be controlled? So you have three forces, three moments three velocities are linear and three velocities angular. So there are actually 12 variables which need to be controlled. And this makes force control very, very difficult. Okay. So now you can appreciate that the mo when the robot was moving around in space, there was no problem. It was moving very uh, easily in space and free space. The moment there is a constraint coming in that is interacting with the environment, what is happening is constraints are being put on the task now and on the robot. And by controlling some of these uh, constraints, we have to perform the task. Now. We see that the constraints are of two types, natural constraints and artificial constraints. Now, what are these two? Let us have a look further uh, in this particular case. Now, our constraint frame has been put, okay. Now, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this frame, if you look at uh, in terms of the task, the robot gripper is holding the handle. Now, it can apply velocities in particular directions and it will, and it cannot apply velocities in particular directions because of the constraints. What do I mean by that? Let's look at the uh, the various constraints, the artificial constraints and the natural constraints first. Okay, so the first thing that we'll look at is the uh, the natural constraints. So let me rub this out, and we will write it here again. So what are the natural constraints? 
The natural constraints are the constraints on the robot because of the nature of the task or the nature of the contact. Okay, so the net, the nature of contact will enforce some natural constraints. So these are my natural constraints. So let's call this natural constraints. Okay, and let me write them here. Well, on the other side, we have the artificial constraints. Okay, so in terms of the natural constraint, uh, how many constraints are there, or what are we trying to control? There are uh, forces and their moments. So there is uh, Vx, Vy, Vz, omega x, omega y, omega z in terms of velocities. Then you have Fx, Fy, and Fz in terms of forces and M mx, let's call it uh, nx, ny, and nz in terms of uh, moments. Okay, so there are actually 12 variables. Some of this would come under natural constraints, some of this will come under artificial constraints. Now, in this case of a robot trying to rotate the handle, hold the handle and rotate the crank, what are the natural constraints? So, the natural constraints are if you see uh, velocity is equal to vx is equal to 0. Okay, please note this very carefully. Can the robot apply a velocity in the x direction in this direction? It cannot. Why? Because it is constrained there. So, when it is holding the handle tightly, it cannot move the crank in this direction because it is a rigid body there, right? So it cannot apply a velocity in the x dot in the x direction, which means that the linear velocity uh, there is a cons natural constraint on v x is equal to z. Uh, uh, sorry, v x is equal to zero. Can it apply a velocity in the z direction? Again, no. This is my z direction. Can it apply a velocity in that direction, that side or this side? No. Again, it cannot apply a velocity in that direction. So my v z is also equal to zero. So these are constraints because of the nature of the contact or the nature of the task, okay? And there is nothing the robot can do about it. So now if you want the robot to apply a velocity of Vx is equal to just for example 10 meters per second, okay? It, it will not be able, it's not possible because of the constraint, okay? What are the angular velocity constraints? Now the angular velocity constraints, what about v, uh, what about your uh, Vy? Can it apply a velocity in this direction? Yes, it is free to because it can rotate in this direction, right? So it can apply a velocity in that direction. So there is a velocity which is possible in this direction. Vy is possible. How much it is, we'll just see. Okay. So Vx, Vz are not possible. Vy is possible. Okay. So Vy is in this direction. So we can write Vy dot. So that is possible in this direction, right? Now, what about the angular velocities? Can it hold the handle like this? The gripper is holding the handle you can see can it rotate like this can it have an angular velocity about the z-axis omega x uh, is that possible no that's not possible why because you can see the handle is a rigid body there so you can't rotate it about that axis like that so again omega x is equal to zero and similarly omega y is equal to zero again it can't rotate like this it's not possible right but it can rotate about the z-axis like this that is possible okay so omega uh, omega z comes this side, okay, so omega uh, z comes this side, okay. So we have uh, covered uh, which two? We have covered uh, vx, v, the linear velocities and the angular velocities, okay. Now what do we have to cover? We have to cover the forces. Now let's look at the forces, fx, fy, fz. Can it apply a force in the, uh, in the x direction? Now can it apply a force like this, fx? Uh, yes, it can apply. Why? Because uh, because uh, this is a rigid body, right? So there will be an equal and opposite reaction in that direction from the handle. So it can apply a force in that direction. Okay. So my fx will go this side. Okay. So fx is going this side. What about in the z direction again? Yes, so fz is going that side. Okay. These are artificial constraints. In the natural constraints, uh, can it apply a force in the y direction? In this direction, Fy, no, it can't apply. Why? Because uh, the moment it starts applying, it will start rotating. So Fy is equal to 0 here. That's a natural constraint. Okay. Similarly, Nz, uh, sorry, let's look at forces first. So Fy is equal to uh, 0. So Fx and Fz are artificial constraints and Fy equal to 0 is a natural constraint. What about moments? Can it apply a moment about the Z axis? Now, the moment it's so it tries to apply a moment about the z-axis, what will happen to start rotating? 
okay so it cannot apply a moment about the uh, z axis so that becomes an artificial constraint again uh, sorry this becomes a natural constraint what about uh, uh, what about moment about the y axis y and the x now can it apply a moment about the uh, about the x axis which means can it apply a moment like this yes it can because there is a rigid body the handle is a rigid body so it can because there is an opposite and equal reaction so this will come here so nx is coming here okay similarly ny is coming there these are uh, artificial constraints okay so the only natural constraint in terms of moment is nz because the moment it tries to apply a moment like this it will rotate the handle will rotate so it can't there is no opposite and equal reaction whereas in the other two cases x and y it can do that so there is a uh, uh, these two constraints will become artificial constraints now to perform this task we are seeing that natural constraints are here okay and there is nothing you can do about them they are all equal to zero that means if you want to have a moment of force in the y direction of having some magnitude it's not possible because it's a natural constraint whereas on the other side if you're looking at uh, the artificial constraints these are constraints which are possible okay so these are constraints which are possible to have motion in those direction or forces in those directions and hence they have to be controlled by possible i mean these have to be controlled to do the task okay now i hope it becomes clear why we have partitioned it like this this is nothing you can do about it so there's no question of controlling them whereas on the artificial constraints they have to be controlled either you have to make them zero or you have to give some uh, velocity okay so in order to move this in a particular direction how are you going to rotate the crank so you have to apply a velocity in this direction the y direction okay in order to perform the task and hence you have to say omega z is equal to let's say alpha okay omega z is equal to alpha that is how you are going to rotate the crank and if you put omega z is equal to alpha this will become r into alpha okay r into alpha right so this is where is r r is this one so this basically means that to perform this task you need an angular velocity uh, and a linear velocity angular velocity about z axis linear velocity about y axis okay and that is how you are going to perform this task to rotate this crank what about the other fellows fx must be equal to zero fz must be equal to zero uh, nx must be equal to zero and ny must be equal to zero now this has to be enforced that means the controller has to ensure that the forces in those directions and moments are zero otherwise the task will not be done so this essentially shows you that force control is actually a difficult task because you need to control so many variables now let's look at another example here uh, the case of a screwdriver now you're familiar with this uh, you can try taking a, screw a screwdriver insert it into a screw and rotate and see uh, how you are performing the task now imagine a robot is going to do this now okay so how will a robot do this the robot will hold the screwdriver okay so let, let me say this is a robotic gripper okay so the robot is going to hold the screwdriver okay tightly and then is going to screw the screw to insert the screw into the uh, surface okay now here also the first thing that we do is we put our constraint frame which is given here by by c so x c y c z c is my constraint c uh, constraint frame that i put now there are constraints because there is contact between the screwdriver which is held by the robot and the screw head okay and we have to control what we have to control vx vy vz uh, omega x omega y omega z and then we have to control uh, we have to control fx fy fz and nx ny nz so forces moments we have to control so we partition this into natural constraints so these are natural constraints and we have our artificial constraints okay like in the previous case we simply partition it and then we see which ones are the ones which are automatically zero so natural constraints are automatically zero so there is nothing you can do about them artificial constraints have to be controlled okay so first we need to do this so if you look at this task in the x-axis y-axis z-axis can you move in this direction no you can't move in this direction why because the the screwdriver is inserted inside the head so you cannot move in that direction okay so automatically the natural constraints are going to become vx is equal to zero similarly we have omega and vz is equal to zero because you can't have a velocity in the z direction right but 
y direction is free so you can actually move in that direction the head will come off the the screwdriver will come off from the head of the screw but you can still move in that direction right so uh, so vx vy becomes zero now omega x is equal to zero and uh, omega y is equal to zero so you cannot have an angular velocity in that direction similarly you cannot have an angular velocity in that direction but you can have an angular velocity about the z axis please note that right now what are the uh, in terms of fy, fy is equal to 0 and nz is equal to 0. Okay. So how do you, if you think a little bit, how do you insert a screw? Uh, how do you tighten a screw rather? So you put the screwdriver head, hold it, hold the screwdriver and you, you up, and you rotate in this direction. Right? That is how you uh, turn the screwdriver and uh, you have to apply a sl small force in this direction also to keep the, these two, uh, the, the screw and the screwdriver in contact. Right? So that's how you tighten a screw. So what are the artificial constraints? The artificial constraints are Vy is equal to 0, otherwise the, it will uh, disengage. Omega z is equal to alpha 2, let's say. So we must have an angular velocity about the z axis, which is our alpha 2, which we are controlling in order to perform the task. Fx must be maintained as 0, nx must be 0, ny must be 0, and your fz must be equal to alpha 3. Okay. So which are the this has to be ensured okay you have to ensure this otherwise the task will not be done so how can you do this uh, we have to control which all these variables so one two three four five six variables have to be controlled here to perform this task and hence a robot would find it very very difficult to tighten a screw if you see uh, industrial robotic applications very very often a robot cannot do tasks where there is contact and that is one problem with uh, robots because you need to control too many artificial constraints. And some of these artificial constraints uh, are constrained in the sense that the position and forces are orthogonal again. So there is one more constraint actually which is coming. So one way of trying to, uh, 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 let's look at the example of peg in the hole assembly. So this is a peg in the hole assembly. So we have a hole and we have a peg here. Okay, and I want to insert it. So for example, first what we can do, we can simply I put my constraint frame this is x y and z frame okay so what we can say is we can have a velocity in the z direction okay so i have a velocity in the z direction so we say vz is equal to alpha until contact is made okay the moment contact is made uh, then you can uh, press it inside okay so we can have uh, force fz is equal to alpha 2 so the moment what i'm saying is that you have the peg push it in this direction because there is free motion and the moment contact is made you can sense that contact and then the uh, the process stops okay so for example if you have peg in hole assembly this is another example now let me take uh, a bigger example okay uh, so we have uh, let's say a base plate and we have a hole in there okay, and you have to insert it here okay let's look at this example okay what are the various steps of motion Suppose this uh, peg could be anywhere else. So what we can do is we can move it downwards okay, and see where contact is being made. So the moment contact is made, you can sense the force. Let's say this is my fx, uh, y and z here. Okay. So suppose this is my x, y and z. I move with the force in this direction. Contact is made. That means I know that there is no hole there. Then what I can do is I can move it in this direction and again try this, trying to push it inside. Okay, so the moment it comes to this hole, now you can move in the z direction. Z direction is possible now. Then what you do is move it in the z direction until contact is made again. So essentially, you are playing with the velocities in the z direction uh, and the forces in the z direction. Okay, in order to insert this uh, peg in hole assembly. So again, it is going back exactly to what we were talking here that which forces and which motions are possible in terms of the constraints which are there. You can divide them into natural and artificial and then proceed. Now let's look at uh, something which we call hybrid force position control. Now in hybrid force position control, for example, uh, this is this is an object and a robot is holding them. Let's say this is a robot gripper. This is a robot gripper. Okay, uh, let me draw it like this. So this is a robot gripper and the robot gripper is closing. Okay. So when it is closing, it is in free space, it is in position control. Okay, so first it is uh, 
closing the robot gripper is closing so this is in position control okay so no contact is there the moment contact is made for example this comes and makes contact with that you have to switch to force control okay. so this means that uh, when you are in position control this finger is closing okay so you are in position control you are controlling the position the moment contact is made you cannot close the finger anymore because you are constrained so you have to switch to force control and then apply a particular force so which means that you are either in the position domain or you are in the force domain but you are not in both of them okay and in between force and position there is some kind of switching going on and uh, uh, there are problems associated with that but this type of control is basically called hybrid control and uh, in hybrid control uh, let me draw the block diagram so this is a position controller okay and this is my force control so there are two separate controllers and this is my position input okay so x desired double dot uh, x desired dot and xd this is the position uh, mode okay and then in the force control mode we have uh, force so we have force desired and uh, this is all going on to the constraints to s and this is my constraints okay so this is uh, my constraints which are there and this is coming here this is going there okay and this is my actual uh, this is my robot arm or robot finger in case of gripper this is going with feedback here and this is going with feedback onto the other side okay so this is my uh, feedback which is going now if you look at this case and try to correlate with the previous one this is a robotic gripper which is trying to grasp this object now if you look at this example you are it's very clear that you are either in the position domain or you're in the force domain you're not in both and you cannot control both simultaneously in the human arm also it is the same human hands i mean when you catch an object you first close your fingers right so you're in position control the moment you make contact with the object now you can't control your position anymore because you're constrained so you're in force control now so this is essentially what is being shown here so you're either in position control domain or you're in force control domain and there is switching between the two okay so this is my constraint which are coming okay so either you're in position domain or you're in force domain but you're not in both of them simultaneously okay so this type of control is basically called hybrid control so a lot of robots uh, which make contact or are used for grasping they work on hybrid control where they're in position domain and then they can switch to force domain now let's see further uh, in terms of tasks so here uh, we were talking about force control and force control essentially deals with contact tasks okay how do we control such tasks we talked about national const uh, natural constraints and artificial constraints now let's see how do we actually control them okay uh, this is very interesting because a lot of the problems here have still not been solved okay we understand pd control pid control very well but not force control okay so in order to control contact tasks in order to control force okay we normally use uh, pd control motion control in terms in terms of uh, partially constrained tasks okay this is one way of controlling hybrid control i just explained then there is something called impedance control okay so position control mode is basically pd pid control which is used for position control only or motion control in free space whereas force control is essentially for partially constrained tasks we have hybrid control where you are controlling force or motion and you have another another type which is called impedance control where you have a relation between the force and the position and you actually go in the position domain by finding this relation between force and uh, position this is something i'll talk about uh, now so before that uh, let's talk about pd and pid control of uh, force okay so uh, uh, the examples that we are looking at what are the uh, various examples this this two are examples let me explain this so it becomes easier so this is a grind robot in a grinding task the robot is grinding there is a grinding wheel you can see there and this is my grinding wheel there okay so it is making contact with the object and applying a force and it is moving in a direction which is orthogonal to it so this is an application of uh, uh, of of constraint task the the picture on the right is a robot writing on a surface so this robot here has a pen you can see the pen the black color marker pen and it has it has to draw this line on the surface okay like that 
So it is writing on a surface now. Again, it is constrained. Why? Because for writing, it has to apply a force in this direction and it has to move in that direction. Okay. How do we design such kind of controllers using PD controllers? That's something we are looking at here. So uh, what we are doing here is that uh, we are writing our equation in this form. So our equation for the robot is equal to, you know, the dynamic equation is mass into acceleration plus uh, Coriolis and centripetal force plus gravity forces plus tau external, which is the external force that is being applied. So this is the applied force the robot is applying onto the environment. This is my dynamic equation. Now to control this torque, I can put a uh, controller like this where tau is equal to k, this is kp into the position and this is kd into the uh, velocities. Okay, so this is my desired position, and this is my desired velocity. Okay, so this is basically my error and I am writing my uh, the dynamic components mass into acceleration corollary centripetal plus gravity here. Okay, now mc, g and h are the, uh, are the internal model of the corresponding mechanicals, uh, mechanical terms of the robot. So if I take this tau and put it here, okay, then what will happen is I am going to get, uh, so if you look here a little bit, okay, what is going to happen is uh, uh, we are going to get this term. Okay. So we have uh, my uh, kp into this term and kd into that term plus m, this is my inertia matrix into this is my desired acceleration minus the acceleration is equal to tau external. Okay, so again, so this is the controller I am proposing. Okay, so what I do is I put it in here and what we do get is the corollary centrifugal terms, some of them are going to cancel, this is going to cancel off. What we will be left with is the, is the, uh, this term, the inertia term. Okay, and uh, this is my equation which I am going to get. Now, this is basically a PD controller equation. Okay, so which means that I am controlling my external applied force by using a by using a position controller which is simply controlling the errors in the position velocity and the accelerations okay now if i say qd minus q is equal to e okay then what we get is this equation now okay so this is one way of controlling the external force that the robot is going to apply okay and we can play with this gains the position gain and the derivative gain. In the beginning of today's uh, lecture, I talked about the stiffness. Okay. Now, this K and D are basically have dimensions of stiffness and damping. Okay. So, by changing the stiffness and the damping, you can make this arm behave in a particular way. So, when I talked about the, when I showed you the video of the robot arm, that the human being was pushing the robot arm and the robot arm was behaving in a particular way. Now, this behaving is being enforced by changing the K and the D matrices. Okay, which are basically the stiffness and the damping matrices. So this is one way of controlling the stiffness and the damping of the robot arm which is interacting with an environment now. Okay. Now let's proceed from here and uh, so this is essentially the equation. Okay. So you can see this is the equation of controlling the defect. Okay. So we are controlling the force applied by the end effector by, in, by using this PD controller such that, such that it can perform the contact task. Okay. Now, uh, uh, in this case, you are basically playing with that K and the D matrices, K and the uh, K and the D or KP and the KD. Okay, so proportional gain and the derivative gain. Okay, so we are playing with these two matrices. Now, because there is contact between the robot end effector and the tool it is holding and the environment, you have to avoid large impact forces. Okay, so when it is writing, if it hits very hard on the surface, then the pen will break. Okay, or the surface will break. Okay, so in this case, you have to avoid large impact forces due to uncertain geometric characteristics or the environment. And you have to adapt, match the dynamic characteristics, uh, in particular stiffness of the environment, in a complementary way. And you may have to mimic human arm behavior. Okay, so this is the first slide I showed uh, today's class that you have a wall and you are going to hit the wall, uh, you are going to apply a force against the wall. Okay, so your stiffness should be low in that direction, whereas when you are moving in this direction, there your stiffness can be high. So you basically have to avoid large impact forces and you have to adapt the dynamic characteristics uh, of the environment. So how can you do that? You can uh, do that by changing that uh, Km matrix. Okay, so that Km is the one that is the gain. 
So if you put a very small KM, you have low contact forces. And if you put a large KM, then you have good tracking. Okay, so you should be able to switch your K, uh, the stiffness of the system, so that it behaves in a particular way that you that you want it to behave. Now let us move on further and look at the other case where you have a robot and a human which are doing a task together now. Okay, so in the previous case there was only a robot, okay here, and the robot was doing a particular task like writing on a surface. Okay, and we saw that the controller would look something like this. Okay where you are basically controlling the uh, applied force by the end effector. Now if you are looking at a case where the robot and the human are doing a task together now, okay. Now this would mean that the, for example, the human is pushing the object in that direction and the robot is either going back or is cooperating as we say, okay, so robot-human cooperation. Now in this particular case, please note that there are two terms that we use. One is called admittance and the other is called impedance, okay. Now the basic difference of this is that if you look at the robot arm, this is a mechanical robot arm, we looked at mechanisms design, uh, we saw that there is an actuator, there is a gear in front, then there is a mechanism and then there is a link. Okay? Now this is controlled by, how is it controlled by Newton's law, okay, force is mass into acceleration. Okay? This is Newton's law which is controlling this mechanism. What about the human? Okay. Now the human arm is controlled by muscles. And these muscles contract and because of that contraction uh, we get a force at the joint and that force is converted into a torque. Okay, So this essentially uh, is a position control system. So this one is a position control system because you are controlling the position Okay, and this is being run by a PD controller. Whereas in the human case these are basically muscles Okay, and the muscles do not follow Newton's law. Okay, So the, the muscles follow this impedance law mass into acceleration plus bx dot plus kx, they follow this model. And this is basically what we call an impedance model. Okay, so there is mass into acceleration, uh, damping plus stiffness, uh, which governs the force applied by the muscle. Now you can see that this equation, if I call it equation one, and if I call this equation two, they are both different equations now, right? So one is uh, basically what we call an admittance controller. So this is admittance. And the other one is an impedance control control going on. Now you might say, so what? Now, so what essentially means that there is a mismatch here now. Now, what do I mean? Suppose the human is applying a force F. Okay. So the human is applying a force F, which will mean that the position which is going to move, or the position the human being is going to move will be X. Okay. That's uh, as per this equation, equation number one. Whereas the robot is going to take this F as an input and put it in equation number 2 and what it will do is it will integrate this equation twice and get x, so let's call it x, uh, x1. Okay. Now this x and this x are going to be different, why? Because even if the force is the same, this is f that is f, this is having mass into acceleration and this one has many more terms. So the effective position that is going to come out after integration will, is going to be different. So which means the robot will move by a different amount and the human will move by a different amount. Please do think about this carefully. So the, if I say this, my x-axis. So the x of the human and the x of the robot are going to be different because although the force is the same for both, the equations of motion are different and hence there is a mismatch now. Now, in order to avoid this mismatch, what we do is we try and uh, make the robot behave like a human, okay. So we also try and make the robot behave like a human. How do we do that? Basically, I take the impedance equation, I integrate it, get the x, and then feed that to the position controller of the robot. Okay, so please uh, listen to this carefully. I want to make the robot behave like the human. Okay, so what we do is, uh, we take this impedance control equation, okay, equation one, integrate it twice, get x, and then use a PD controller, give it to the robot, and the robot is going to behave for that particular X. Okay, and hence there will be a match, otherwise there will be a mismatch. How do we do that? Uh, this, this is a, another example where a robot and a human are uh, are uh, working together. So this is a hand axis and uh, you can see that. So this uh, is a hand exoskeleton, and it is closing and it is opening. So there is a human and there is a machine. Okay, so this kind of controllers are basically designed by using impedance controllers. 
So simple position control or force control won't work here. Why? Because there is position also force also. Plus the the position controller of the robot arm, okay, is working just on PD control mode. Position, which is the position controller. Whereas the human being is working on a force control mode. And there is mismatch between these two now. Okay. So let's look at uh, how do we design such systems. So one way of designing such systems is this way, where uh, you have an impedance control. So let me just explain this. So what we do is we have a human who is going to apply a force. There will be a force sensor which is going to measure the force. So there is a force sensor there which is measuring the force F. So what, what it will do is for this F, it is going to integrate this equation twice. So integrate twice and get X. Okay, so it will integrate this equation twice and get X. Then it will take this X and give it to the robot controller and the robot controller is going to uh, is going to do in position control which is the PD control and it can simply move back. Okay, so I'll repeat this again. There is a force sensor which is measuring the force applied by the human. So the robot is taking that force as an input, integrating this equation, the impedance equation twice, getting X position. Then it is giving the X to the PD controller which is here and then it is in position control mode. Okay, so this is a case of a robot human uh, cooperation uh, case where a robot and a human or any machine working with a human can work together okay, without having a mismatch. Now a problem that comes up here is uh, uh, if you look at this equation force is equal to mass into acceleration plus c into x dot there is an m and a c. Okay, so this is uh, inertia and that is uh, damping. There can also be a spring which is k into x. Okay. So these terms have to be found out because these are variables, you know. So what we can do is we can do a human experiment. Say, for example, this is a human experiment where we have two humans carrying an object or in this particular case, we can have a human and another human carrying an object. You look at the forces and you track the positions and then try and find the M, C and K parameters for that motion. Okay. So for example, in this case, uh, an object is being carried by two humans and we are measuring the forces applied and the positions uh, changes and we can fit it into a we draw this curve which is the force and the position applied by the humans two humans uh, so force position characteristics for two humans so two humans here okay then what we do is for the variation of uh, velocity what we see is that mck parameters are not constant so m into x double dot plus c into x dot this M and C are not constants, but they vary with uh, acceleration. Okay, they vary with velocity. Sorry, that means when you are just starting the motion, your M is high, is M is low, sorry, and then it becomes high. Whereas C, when you are starting the motion, is low and then becomes high. Now you can think a little bit why it is like that. Essentially, because when you are starting motion, you have to give uh, apply a force, right? And when you are stopping the motion, you have to decelerate. So that basically means you need to accelerate and decelerate and because of which you are changing the MNC parameters. So by recording this uh, characteristics for two humans, we can basically fit curves for different positions of acceleration and deceleration and then we can find the MC parameters. Then I take this equation, integrate it twice, get the X and put it to the PD controller. So what we are saying here is this is basically a robot human cooperation control by First, learning how two human beings do the task. Then, uh, learning means I first record two human beings do the task. I record their force and motion data. From that, I find the M and the C parameters, MCK parameters. Then, I fit the MCK parameters onto this model and then integrate it twice, get the position, and then put it in a position controller. Now, the robot is going to behave like a human. Okay, so exactly like the way a human being behaves, the robot is going to also behave like that. Okay. So this is the basic impedance control structure that we have a force sensor which is measuring the human force. So the human force is coming there. It is integrating this model twice, getting the position and then giving to the position controller and the robot gripper or the robot arm moves accordingly. And now there will be perfect match between the robot and the human. Okay. Now you note here this is not Newton's law. Okay, uh, this equation that is being used here is not Newton's uh, forces mass into acceleration. There are other terms also. Okay, so this is one way where we can control the force being applied by a robot and a human together. We can also use this for controlling a robot. Okay, for behaving like a human. Okay, so in one of the the second videos I showed today, 
there was a robot arm which was moving in a particular way or behaving in a particular way. So again, by changing the MC parameters of the controller, I can basically make the arm behave like a human. So first, you record the data from two humans, uh, find the MNC parameters, then use this impedance model and then control the robot. Okay. So these are uh, this is uh, some ways of uh, uh, of controlling a robot and a human which are performing a task together. So this is also an example of a robot and a human uh, doing a task together. Okay, so you can see that uh, there is a, a, ro a robotic hand, which is an exoskeleton, which is uh, closing and opening a patient's hand. Okay, so there is a robot and a human who are working together. Now, if you simply use Newton's law, uh, there is going to be a mismatch between the forces and there will be trouble. So this is an impedance controller, which is actually uh, controlling the robot after learning how after learning the MC parameters of a human hand. Okay, so we can change the stiffness of the mechanical device so that it behaves like a human being. Okay, so this was the moral of the story of today's lecture, where we started off by looking at. Uh, so if, uh, when we looked at uh, the uh, the second video that we looked at today was the mechanical device which is behaving in a particular way. So we looked at this video where we said that uh, this was a mechanical device. Okay and how it behaves is simply by changing the stiffness, okay. So one way you can simply change the K as I looked at uh, in the case of the PD controller and the other way is by trying to put an impedance controller where you are changing the MC and the K in a particular way. So by changing that you can make it uh, behave very stiffly or you can make it behave uh, very flexibly, okay. The example was also there for this, uh, uh, for this robotic arm. That the robotic arm was behaving in a particular way whether it was very stiff so this is a very stiff arm you push it and leave it okay and it is going to uh, or this is a little bit less spring arm uh, less uh, less k okay or less stiffness arm where you're where you're uh, pushing the arm and leaving it and it is behaving in a particular way okay so oh, where did that go so yeah let's look at it so this is a very stiff arm, okay. Now this has a different uh, kind of behavior, it's coming down slowly. So you're basically playing with that K and C parameters, okay, okay. Now let's look at, uh, yeah, so this is more human being like. Okay, simply by playing with the damping parameters. Okay, so stiffness and damping is what they are uh, playing with. Now you can also play with the arm by putting a impedance controller and making it behave like a human. Okay, so that can also be done. So these are basic examples that we looked at today and the various applications for uh, using force control, hybrid control, uh, force position control and impedance control. So this is having directional impedance, uh, sorry, directional stiffness. In a particular direction, it is very stiff. In another direction, it is uh, not that stiff. Okay. So these are examples that are showing us uh, uh, how we can make the robot arm behave in a particular way. Okay. So today's lecture will be uh, ending today's lecture here and uh, in the next class we will move on to the next topic. So today what we try to do is talk about force control. Now some things to remember in force control is that when you are controlling force in contact with an environment you have to control uh, almost 12 variables. You have to control velocities, you have to control forces moments and there are natural constraints, artificial constraints and this makes force control very very difficult because of which most robots do not go into force control kind of tasks like uh, a robot would find it very difficult for example tightening a screw is very easy for a human but very difficult for a human uh, very difficult for a robot okay so there are many tasks which we can do very easily but a robot would find very very difficult to do essentially because this natural constraints and artificial constraints uh, need that you control a very large number of variables okay so today we'll stop here and then we'll uh, continue in the uh, in the next lecture 
Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank <music> you.